120 people in the upper room who were filled with the Spirit and went out and turned the world upside down for Jesus. It's so hard to realize there's over 2 billion Christians today and it started with just a handful of people. That Jesus trusted his ministry to 12 of the most wackiest men that probably walked the earth back then and discipled them, walked with them, encouraged them to do something great for God. And every one of us have that opportunity today because we're still being sent out, aren't we? And he's still having his way in so many people's lives. I want to preface what I want to talk about today about just think about some of the hot issues that we face today as, as Americans and even Christians today. There are so many controversial issues out there that, that people really feel strong about, so strong that we see that there's such strong opinions that oftentimes ends up in disputes or arguments. Some of them are social, some of them are political, and we think some of the controversial topics today would be abortion. Some people are pro-life and some aren't. Euthanasia today, uh, homosexuality, gay marriage, gays who are parents. Obamacare is a big one today. A lot of people fight that and feel strong about it one way or the other. Legalizing marijuana, assisted suicide. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. And, or if you watch the news, particularly if you watch Fox one day, you feel strong about this, you watch CNN the next day and you feel strong about that on the other side. I mean, there are a lot of proponents out there sharing what they feel about some of these issues. But today I want to talk about what's extremely controversial in the church, a, a spiritual issue. And that really deals with spiritual gifts that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14. There's so many strong feelings concerning spiritual gifts. And one of the hottest topics today, and it's been that way for years and years and years, is the gift of tongues. There's so many pros and cons regarding this gift. Is it legitimate today? Is it real? Is it the work of the enemy? Are the gifts for today or have they ceased? And those are things we want to look at today in the next few moments that we have together. So why don't we turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. The Apostle Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth. He established the work there. God was doing some incredible things. They were a unique church because they didn't come behind lacking in any spiritual gift. They were really a charismatic group. And Paul was a charismatic leader. He believed in the gifts of the Spirit. But he knew that there was something going on in this church that was wacky. He realized that the gifts were being abused. They weren't in line with order. They weren't in line with scripture. And so he goes in, or at least he writes, to correct some of the abuse and begins to reaffirm the importance of gifts. But again, he sets boundaries there. He could easily just said, you know what? The gifts are, are being used, uh, you know, or being abused, and we're not going to talk about gifts any longer. But they were too important to Paul. These gifts were so important to Paul that he writes 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14 for us. For us, I believe. Not only for them, but for us. So let's look at this. And we ask the Holy Spirit just to be here and grant illumination to these passages of scriptures. And wherever you might be on this divide, maybe God will give us all clarity. And we can see maybe more clearly as we look at these verses. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts introduces us to this very fact. There are a bunch of spiritual gifts. As we go through the scriptures, we know there is at least 25. There might even be more. Even celibacy is a gift. Paul says not all men have that gift, but he did. There are some of you who are single today, and that's your gift, and it's a wonderful gift. But he says there are different gifts, but it's the same spirit. The same Spirit's the source of them all. And so we realize in all these gifts, we realize it's the Holy Spirit who's the source of them. We not only receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but he has gifts. And we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but also the fruit of the Spirit. And he goes on and gives us a little 
introduction to these gifts, if you would. There are different kinds of service, but we all serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in us all. And I love this, that God works in so many different ways. You know, you can't put God in the box, can we? And when we talk about these spiritual gifts, we need to realize that God works in so many different ways. And if we had time, we could go through all the book of Acts and realize, particularly when it comes to this gift of tongues, God seems to work in so many different ways with so many different people. Verse 7, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Why is a spiritual gift given to each one of us? Here Paul suggests that every one of us who are believers have a spiritual gift. You probably have one, and you're probably not even aware of it today. You just maybe think it's just an attribute or a talent that you have, but these are supernatural. And he tells us that every one of us as believers have a spiritual gift, but what are the gifts for? What's the scripture tell us here? So that what? That we can what? Help each other. I just love this thought. Christianity is not easy. Serving Jesus, you know, really it's not come and live, it's come and die, isn't it? That we need to die out to our own whims and wishes and our own desires and we need to surrender our, li- our lives to Jesus. Hanging on a cross is not easy. Paul says, take up your cross daily. Daily. Why? Because we always have to face the reality, are we going to do it or not? I need you to help me to die daily. I need you in my life to encourage me and to build me up at times when I am low. I need you to encourage me as my cheerleaders and say, God, George, keep going for God. And you need me. These spiritual gifts are so important because they're given to build up each other, the body of Christ. And oftentimes we think it's the pastor's job or the pastor's and the leader's job to build up one another. But the reality is, is that that we're all called with a spiritual gift to build each other up. What is your gift? What's God's gift to you that you use to build up your marriage, your brothers, your sisters, your mates, your relatives? What gift is that? And maybe today you would just begin to think about it. And as we share some of these gifts, it's not an exhaustive list. We're only going to look at nine and really focus on two. But what is your gift? It could be teaching. It could be mercy. It could be hospitality. It could be a myriad of things. But Paul here is talking about these supernatural gifts that somehow I think the Corinthians were kind of getting it out of order. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice or the supernatural gift of wisdom. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The King James says, a word of knowledge. Those are special gifts, aren't they? Well, if you're struggling with wisdom, a decision in your life, wouldn't it be great if a brother or sister came up to you and said, you know, the Lord has shown me something, and I really think you need to do this. And all of a sudden you realize, thank you, Father. Thank you for speaking through my brother and sister, because really I was perplexed in despair. I didn't know which way to turn, right or left. And they gave me a word. Or the gift of knowledge, supernatural knowledge, knowledge that you've never experienced before. God just breathes it into you about a certain situation or a subject matter, whatever it might be. And you can use it to bless someone with that. He goes on and says, the same spirit in verse 9 gives great faith to others. That's so important to me. Because when my my faith is weak, I'm so thankful for those who have the gift of faith. That I can hang on to their faith and walk me through the valley of the shadow of death or that dark night of my soul. Don't we need people of faith around us at times when our faith is weak? They build us up and encourage us. Yeah, I thank God for that. Maybe you have that gift. The question is, are you using it to build up the body? Another, he says, someone has, the Spirit also gives the gift of healings. Who has the gift of healing here? Boy, if that gift is here, we need it today, don't we? How many of us are struggling with issues in our life? 
Maybe we're battling some sickness. Maybe a disease, maybe cancer. A life-threatened disease. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we find out who has this gift? Or we should pray that someone here would have that gift. At the end of the service, we can say this brother or this sister has a gift of healing. They have the gift of faith. And if you need prayer, come on up. And somehow they energize you to believe that, that everything's okay. Wouldn't that be wonderful? He gives one person the power to perform miracles. Wow. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Lord, I need a miracle. Well, go see Frank or Betty. They have that gift. They have the faith to believe that I can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you would even ask to think. Another one, the ability to prophesy. Boy, that's important. That they have a word of the Lord for you, a specific word. You're praying, Lord, I just need direction, or I need a word from you. I need to know you're there. And a brother or sister comes up and says, God gave me this supernatural word from heaven for you. You know, and it brings direction in your life. Or it brings comfort. You think, thank you, Lord, for that. You are cognizant of me. You are mindful of me. And you use my brother and my sister to remind me of that word of prophecy. He also gives the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit or from another spirit. There are many times we're asking, Lord, is that preacher on TV aligned with your will or purpose? The gift of discernment, discerning a spirit, a man, a teacher, a certain environment. Boy, we need that gift. And if we don't have it, to find somebody in the body, say, hey, Frank or Betty again or Bill or Sue or whatever, what do you think? And because they operate in that gift, and that gift is to build the body up, they're able to share that. I shared in the first service how important this is, because God sets the solitary in families. We're a family here. At times, we might not act like it, but we really are. And because we're family, God sets people in here to enable us and help us, to encourage us to move forward in God. I remember there was a time in my life where I used to drive around without a jack. I don't know why I did that, you know. Maybe it was stolen, I don't remember, but I didn't have a jack, and I was always concerned if I'd got a flat tire, what would happen? In essence, that's what it is in my spiritual life at times. At times, I'm flat. I don't have the joy of the Lord. Things are happening. I'm beginning to question so many things, and I need to be jacked up. I need someone who has a gift of encouragement or a gift of grace or mercy to come alongside me and, and jack me up, right? Wouldn't that be great? You know who to call when you need a miracle. You know who to call when you need a healing. You know who to call when you need some faith. You know who to call when you need some wisdom. Is that cool? Yes, George, that'd be cool. I mean, it would just be so cool. I mean, these, are, these gifts are so important that we would develop them to build up the body of Christ that we begin to see each other growing like never before in the things of the Lord. Another, still another, is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. Wow. While another is given the ability to interpret what's being said. It's the one and the only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. They're, they're all from God. Tongues, interpretation, prophecy, miracles, faith. They're, they're all from the Spirit of God, he says here. He alone decides which gift each of us should have. And yet, though, the Bible says that we should desire spiritual gifts. Quickly, the nine gifts are often divided into three groups of three. So I think this is important under the heading of revelation gifts. What are the revelation gifts? These revelation gifts that God gives us. He just speaks into our heart, our spirits. The word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning the spirits. And there's the power gifts, so important. The gift of faith, the gift of miracles the gift of healing, and the vocal gifts. These gifts are the ones that are probably most difficult to begin to exercise and probably easy to be abused, but different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. All these gifts are miraculously given to us by God. We, we cannot manufacture them on our own. They're empowered by the Holy Spirit. These are supernatural gifts. These are not natural talents. I often say that God has given us talents, natural talents. He's weaved us together in our mother's womb. He's fashioned us. He's given us our personality. 
and he's gifted us with so many natural talents. And Jesus gives gifts also. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4, where he, the Bible says he is, when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. What were the gifts? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are gifts of service. He gave them to the church to build up the church. What the Bible says is that he gives them to the church in order that they might build up the body, that the body would do the ministry. The ministry takes the whole body, every one of you, to be strong. We need every one of you. You need me, I need you. Paul goes on to say, can a foot say I have no need of an eye or I no need of a hand? No, we, we need each other. We're the body. He uses that analogy. We're the body. Every one of our parts are needed in the natural. They're needed in the spirit. You're so needed. You're so needed. If we're going to see this church grow. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, King James. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. They were ignorant. And Paul says, it's not my desire for you to be ignorant when it comes to spiritual gifts. And yet, so many people have never heard of the gifts, or either they don't understand the gifts. And Paul says here, as a father in the Lord, I don't want you to be ignorant of them. As we look at this, the purpose of these gifts primarily is to build up and strengthen one another. And every one of us as believers should want a gift. And that's the least we can do for each other, to seek these gifts, whatever they might be, and use them for the good of this body. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I know that's what you want. That's why we're talking about it. So here's the question that often comes when someone talks about spiritual gifts, particularly some of the vocal gifts. Are these gifts mentioned in the Bible valid for us today? And it's a great question. Because remember I told you it's a hot issue? Spiritual gifts are really a hot issue. There are those churches who believe they've ceased. And there are other churches that take it to extreme and get filled with emotionalism and swing from the chandeliers and focus everything on the emotions and on spiritual gifts. It just seems to be a wide divide and we're trying to find balance and that's what I love about Calvary. And I don't know how you feel about it. I don't know where you're at. That, yeah, you believe the gifts are for today, or no, they ceased. And oftentimes we realize that there are many people who, who are known as cessationists, that the gifts have ceased. They just say they're no longer valid for today. They were made for the early church, for the apostles then. And once the scriptures were fulfilled, or the canon was complete, all those gifts were done away with. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, some of us have. Some of us probably are cessationists here. And we don't think they're valid today. Tongues is no longer valid. Prophecy is no longer valid. Why? Because we have scripture. It's complete. All these other gifts, sign gifts, we don't need them any longer. They, they, they were there to, again, authenticate the apostles that they really were from God. And I understand that. Some people feel that way. But why do these cessationists take such a hard stand against the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Is it found in Scripture? And we find out there's a passage that they use, and I want to take you there. It's in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. I want to remind every one of us, none of us usually approach the Scriptures with an open mind. We view it through our prejudice. If you're a Baptist, you view it from a Baptist perspective. If you're a Pentecostal, you view the Word through a Pentecostal perspective perspective. If you're Calvary Chapel, you do it the same way. If you're Catholic, whatever. If you're Mormon, we all have our prejudice, and it's so easy to allow ourselves to allow those prejudices to fill over into these pages, and we begin to see it the way we really want to see it. And that's why it's so good if we can do that, if we could just lay our prejudice aside, our preconceived ideas, the traditions of men, the doctrines of men, and just look at the scripture and let scripture interpret scripture. That is the greatest tool that you can learn as a Bible student. Let scripture interpret itself. No one else. Let scripture do that. Let the Holy Spirit help you. That doesn't mean we don't have teachers. But let the scriptures interpret themselves. So here's why cessationists exist today. Look at this. Love never ends. We know that. So important. 
as for prophecies, and this is Paul writing, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. And as for knowledge, it will pass away. So cessationists say, here's the passage. Love will prevail, but all these other things will cease. And he goes on in verse 9, he says this, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So, you know, our prophecy is not complete. You know, that's why the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, not to quench the spirit, but allow prophecy to take place, but always to test it. We always need to test prophecies because we're human people subject, again, to fallibility. But here's the key verse. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What are the partials? It's tongues here, right? It's knowledge here, right? And it's prophecy. Those are things that are partial or incomplete. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So important. So here's their thought. Their thought is this, a cessationist. That which is perfect is the word of God. And because we have the complete canon now in our hands, both Old and New Testament, the gifts have ceased. That's speaking into the text. There's nowhere in this text that says that this perfect is Scripture. Not in this portion of Scripture. Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And so a lot of people think, those are just childish gifts. They're not needed today. But... Don't you need to be built up? Don't you need at times a brother or sister to have a gift that can minister to you, encourage you, and build you up? He goes on and says in verse 12, For we now see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. I would like to think what it's saying is I don't have a perfect revelation of who Jesus Christ is. But one day I will see him face to face. That's how I like to look at this text. As we look in the book of Revelation, it talks a little bit about that in the new kingdom. There will be no need need for light. Why? Because he's the divine illumination. And he talks about that we will see him face to face. Perfect knowledge of who Jesus is as we look upon him. But I only see through a mere dimly today. One day face to face. I know in part, then I shall fully be known, even as I've been fully known now. So I shall know fully even as I've been fully known. And I love this passage because I I, I think, you know, as the cessationists build their doctrine on this, I think it's the very opposite. When the perfect comes, I believe, is when we see Jesus in his second coming. As I think about that, we realize that if that's true, then the gifts of the Spirit are going to be with us to the end of time, till Christ returns. And the end of time is between the ascension of Christ and his return. I think about Moses and about the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses and the other books that were in the Old Testament. Yet even in the midst of that, when they had those books, we see a lot of people moved in the spirit. The spirit came on people and there were miracles, whether it was Elisha or Elijah or or even Moses himself. No verse in this section mentions anything about the completion of scripture or all the collection of the New Testament verse. So how do they come to that? That's their choice. That's how they see it, because they see it through the eyes of a cessationist. To say that these gifts are no longer needed, let me ask you this. What are we called to do? What we've been talking about. But you shall receive power, after which the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. You're going to be my witness. Now now you think this. Has that mandate ceased? Of course not. Are we still called to preach the gospel to the nations? I think we all would believe yes. Well, let me ask you this. Is God a respecter of persons? Would he give the gifts to the apostles and not to us? The gifts of faith and miracles, tongues and prophecy? Go do the work. I'm equipping you to go do it. Go do it. But now, us now, at this time, In human history, God says, you're not going to get them. I'm going to tie your hands behind you. I'm going to tie your feet and go get out the the gospel. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Would not he want to equip us to continue the ministry that the apostles started, to preach the gospel, 
To declare who Jesus is with power? Huh? Paul says, I don't come with precising or persuading words of men's wisdom, but I come in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't we need that today? Aren't we insipid? Aren't we inept today? Aren't we omnipotent today as a church? Often as we think we look at churches today, where's the power? Where's the power? But Jesus took it from us way back when the scriptures were completed. Come on, you think so? You send your kids to school without a lunch pail or a backpack, have food in it? You just send them out in the world to make it on their own? No, no, we, we pack their backpacks filled with goodies, right? Twinkies and all that stuff, you know how that is, huh? I finally got you to laugh. Thank you. Thank you. You are emotional at times. You can laugh. Thank you. I really think he wants us to take the baton and run with it. And I really do think that he wants us to have everything we need to get the job done. Terrible to have a boss that expects you to get a job done, but he doesn't provide you the tools wherewith to get it done. Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit to get the job done. He hasn't left us as orphans, the Bible says. He's equipped us with the power of the Holy Spirit and these gifts in order that we can build up the body, that we can go out into the world and reach the world for Jesus Christ. These sign gifts are important to me today. It's called power evangelism. Man, we go out and we... Pray for somebody at our, our work who's sick or afflicted. They're unbelievers. They hate God. They're indifferent to the things of the Spirit. And you say, may I pray for you? And you have the gift of healing and they get healed? Isn't that a sign? And maybe God's real? Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, it'd be cool, George. It would be cool. It would be cool. Or have a word of knowledge for someone at work. You know, I know you're struggling with this issue, but... You know, the Lord has revealed to me something about what's going on, and I'd stay away from that, or I would go ahead and get into this. Well, thank you. And all of a sudden, they just realize that you're operating in a realm that they never experienced before, and you just say, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Can you use an example? Thank you. Uh, to me, when I think about God sending us out without the equipment, it's like getting married and never going on a date from there on out. And I use this illustration, the first of I think so true. A woman was really struggling with her husband because he never told her that he loved her for 40 years. And she began to say, why, why haven't you told me you've loved me these last 40 years? And he said this, he said, I told you that when I married you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. You know, it's like, is that comforting? Do you feel like you're the most important person in his life that he hasn't told you for 40 years? You know, is that how the Lord treats us? No, not at all. Does 1 Corinthians 13 tell us when miraculous gifts will cease? Again, 13.10, it could be paraphrased, when the perfect has come, prophecy in tongues and other imperfect gifts will pass away. The only problem that remains here is to determine the when, the when. And I think several factors are seen in the context here that would help us. And I really do believe the perfect comes from the time when Christ returns because we have 1 Corinthians 1.7. Let's look at that for a moment. Paul tells the Corinthians here, you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how long is these gifts going to last? Till when? Till the what? Re the revealing? Come on, talk with me. To the revealing of Jesus Christ? Let me help you with another translation. Now you have every gift from God while you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to what? Come back again. The message has it great too. Just think, you don't need a thing. You got it all, all God's gifts, right in front of you as you wait expectantly for our Messiah Jesus to arrive on the scene for the finale. I really do believe as we look at scripture, we, we see here that that's what Paul thought, that you have all the gifts, they're there to the final finale. Have we reached that yet? Nah, of course not. 
Has he come back yet? No, no. So Paul says the gifts here are given for the church between the period of his ascension and his second coming. What do you think of that? You for it? Yeah, well, yeah, three of you are. Thank you, thank you. Great, great group. Great group. So I want to just look at a few passages. I want to look, if we can, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to talk about two gifts, particularly, because I think they're most controversial and most understood, and those are the gifts of tongues, interpretation, or prophecy. Let me share this with you just real briefly. There's one tongue that we have on earth. That's our native language. Some of us are bilingual. Most of us aren't. But that's the one tongue that we have or one language that we have. And, and in the book of Acts, particularly in Acts chapter 2, we know that the apostles began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were magnifying the Lord, and that's so great. And every one of the people who were there heard the different disciples, and we think there were 120 of them at that time. And they're all speaking a different dialect. The Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak in a foreign language. And many heard that and said, wow, they're speaking in our dialect. We had no idea. They're Galileans and they're speaking in our language. And so we do have this gift of tongues, tongues of the earth. But Paul also talks about a tongue that's different. It's from heaven. It's a heavenly tongue. And we'll look at that as we see in the Bible here. So as we see in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I'm, I'm nothing. And I would like to suggest, and I can't prove that, but I really do think that when angels come from heaven to earth, they speak our language. If not, we couldn't understand them. But I don't think they speak English in heaven. I think they have their own language. What that language is, I have no idea. But Paul says, even if I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love, I'm nothing. So there might be a space there for us to look at and realize that maybe there is this tongue from heaven. So we have to find scripture to bear that out, don't we? Acts 2 and 4, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other languages. We know that these languages were known languages, but we want to go further than that. So I want to look at 1 Corinthians 14 as we bring it to a close. 14.1. Pursue love. Remember, chapter 12, nine gifts of the Spirit. People are abusing them. Sandwiched between verse chapter 14, then he begins to explain a little bit about the gifts. Is love there? And so he finishes up in verse 1. So pursue love. Guys, get it. Listen. You know, what we're doing is not love. What we're doing is chaotic. It's causing conflict, confusion. Let's get back to love because love serves. And that's the purpose of the gifts, to serve. Then he goes on to say, and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So Paul could have easily just said, no more gifts in the church. That's it. I'm not putting up with it any longer. The Holy Spirit's getting a bad rap. You're abusing it. Let's just stop there. And sadly, that's what so many churches have done. They've seen the abuse, and they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We don't want tongues in our church. We don't want those gifts here. We don't want prophecy or miracles or laying on hands of people for healing. No, we, no, no, we just, we want a clean, sanctified group of people. We don't want to mention this. It gets people all upset, and some people get it weird, and no, 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 no. He says, but earnestly desire spiritual gifts. He said, keep doing it. When's the last time you earnestly desired a spiritual gift? When's the last time I did? And I think I'm challenged as I look at this. You know, I'm thinking, Lord, when's the last time I really, really asked you for a gift that would be build up the body of Christ. And what's the best gift? The gift that's needed at the time. I might have the gift of healing, but you're perfect, so it's not the best gift. Your health is just perfect. I might have the gift of miracles, but you don't need one. It's whatever gift is needed at the time. If you're sick, the best gift is the gift of healing, right? If you're struggling, again, confused about which direction, the best gift for you is not a miracle. The best gift for you is a word of wisdom to give you direction. It's whatever gift works. And so I need to pray, Lord, I want to build up the body. I want to encourage this church. I want this church to rock and roll for you, Jesus. 
I want the saints to be filled with your spirit and we spill out into the highways and byways of life and we're contagious. We're contagious with your love and your presence. And wherever we go, people are getting infected by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, George. Yeah. Whatever gift that is they need. <laughs> uh, put up with me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so earnestly desire spiritual gifts and specially, and specially, underline that, prophecy. Why? We'll see. So pursue love, because without love, the gifts have no value. So they should earnestly desire spiritual gifts, particularly prophecy. And prophecy is a special revelation that we receive from the Holy Spirit. It's a word that we might have for the congregation. It's more than just preaching. It's not really thus saith the Lord, but yet it is. It doesn't measure to complete scripture. It, has, it doesn't even hold a candle to scripture. Scripture is our final authority. It's scripture that we judge prophecy, but it's a word that maybe the Lord would speak to us regarding the direction of the church or word for someone. It's just a revelation that we get. So we continue here. For one who speaks in the tongue speaks not to men, but to God. So if you have a gift of tongues, what's the direction of your tongue? To the church or to who? Get this. This is so important because here's where the abuse takes place. I've been in so many Pentecostal churches, and when they interpret a tongue, it's always God speaking to us. This says the tongue speaks to God. It's God-directed, not man-directed. It's not a word from God to man. It's a word from man to God. It's our praise. It's, it's a direction there or our prayer. Get this. This is so important, okay? For no one understands him. Get that. Let's make it clear. It's unintelligible. It's a language that we do not know. It's a language of angels. We do not know that. Notice this. But he utters mysteries in the spirit. It's a spiritual language. This tongue is a spiritual language. It's not a human language. And if we just let scripture share itself and interpret itself, then we can say, now I get it now. Primary, it is directed toward God through prayer, through praise, through thanksgiving. And the neat thing about it is that God understands it. Isn't that cool? Might be foreign language to me, even though I speak in tongues. It might be a foreign language to you, but God understands it. Excuse me. Let's go on a little bit more. On the other hand, he who prophesies, what? speaks to man. It's God speaking to us through this prophecy. Boy, I need God to speak to me personally at times. I know I have the word, and I know the word's the final authority for my faith and for practice. But sometimes the word doesn't deal with everything that I'm going through. I find comfort in it, but sometimes, you know, Lord, do I, you know, I, do I buy that car or this car, you know, or whatever it is. You know, I, I can't look in the Bible and say, buy Chevy instead of a Ford. You know, I I might need some direction. I'm being facetious, but there's times where I need some direction that I can't maybe find it in the scriptures, and I need God to tell me. But I want you to see this. He speaks to people. For what reason? What does prophecy do? It tells us here. Read it. For what? For upbuilding and encouraging and comforting, right? Prophecy should build us up should encourage us and bring comfort. If it doesn't bring comfort, it's not from God. If it doesn't build us up, it's not from the Lord. That's why we need to discern these prophecies. And remember, we prophesy in part. We don't have complete understanding, but people so often use prophecy to beat the church up. Or they'll prophesy in the name of the Lord and say, you're no good, you know, you're bad, you know, and this and on and on and on. We all know that, don't we? None of us are perfect. What we need is encouragement. We need someone to speak a prophetic word that would build us up and bring comfort. Let's continue. Paul says God uses prophecy. That's why he said, I want you to desire to prophesy because I want you to upbuild, exhort, and edify the people of God. I 
love that. Moving quickly, yeah. Verse 4. The one who speaks in a tongue, what? Goes up and south. The one who prophesies, who did he build up? The church. The one who speaks in tongues, what? Builds up himself. You ever need to be built up? You ever dragging spiritually? All right, God, I'll read the Bible. Oh, gosh, do I have to? You know, we're dragging. There's times where the world is just closing in on us. We can call that the dark night of the soul as it's so eloquent, it's been shared in the past. And we just need to be edified. We need to be energized. We need to be built up. God says, I got a gift for you. The one who speaks in the tongue builds himself up. The one who prophesies builds up the church. We got to get that. We got to see the contrast there. So we speak mysteries. We speak to God, spirit to spirit. We don't understand it, but we speak. And we edify ourselves. In verse 5, now I want you all to speak in tongues. What does Paul want us all to do? If you're not a cessationist, then you've got to embrace this. I want you all to speak in tongues. Will we all speak in tongues? No, we won't. Paul makes that clear. Not, not all speak in tongues. There are those who believe what he's talking about, the tongues in a church service, not private tongues. But, but I know a lot of people who have the spirit who don't speak in tongues. But I want you all. That's his wish. I want you all. That's my wish. I have the gift. It's a wonderful gift. There's times where I just can't pray with my mind. It's clouded. I'm defeated. I hear voices. I'm distracted. I need my spirit to bypass my mind and go straight into the presence of God. And that's what this gift does. But he says here, even more to prophesy. I want you to build up the church. I want you built up, but more than anyone else, I want your life to be a blessing to this church that you're a part of. I want you to build up the body of Christ. I want you to learn to prophesy. I want you to be still and hear the voice of God in order that he can reveal to you something that you can bring to the body of Christ. Now, we see that sometimes in, in preaching. You know, we pray before we get up here, Lord, what do you want me to share? And in aspects, that's a, a form of prophecy. But I don't think every one of them were preachers at this time, but they were in tune to the Holy Spirit. So Paul affirms the gift of prophecy. But what other gift does he affirm here? The gift of tongues, right? I want you all to speak in tongues. He affirms both gifts. Well, I'll take prophecy, but I won't take tongues. That's your choice. But Paul affirms both gifts. But he'd rather have us prophesy, and we know why. Verse 12, so with yourselves, since you're eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. And that is such a beautiful verse. You can underline that. Underline that. I hope that's every one of our wishes today. When Pastor Aaron asked us to come, you know, we're reluctant to come. You know, it wasn't because of you, the most wonderful congregation, but my son pastors, my old church, I mean, we wanted to be there. But just the very fact that he thought that we might have something that would help the church. In short, I've always felt that way. You know, you know, have Bible, we'll travel, right? I mean, have gift, we'll travel. If Jesus has given me the gift of pastor, have gift, we'll travel. If the congregation needs a pastor, I got the gift, what am I going to do? I'm going to go and use my gift to what? To build up the church. And I hope since I've been here that some of you have been blessed. Probably most of you haven't, but maybe one or two of you have been blessed since I've been here. Or at least blessed with Shar, anyhow. You know? Verse 13. Therefore, one who speaks in the tongue should pray for the power to interpret. And that's the neat thing. Now, he's saying that we can have two gifts here. As Paul says, I, I want you to have the gift of tongues, but I also want you to prophesy. I mean, uh, interpret the tongue. And obviously, because he goes on and explains that if you talk in tongues and you're speaking to God in a language no one knows, they, they won't be blessed. Even though you might be saying something wonderful, speaking mysteries in the Spirit, no one can figure that out. Paul tells us a little bit about tongues here now. This is great. Verse 14, for if I pray in the tongue, what, what's really taking place? What's he teach us here? My spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. I have no idea what I'm saying. I can, it's not cognizant to me. I can't figure it out. 
you know, the spirit just bypasses my mind. I, I, I'm praying with my spirit. It's spirit to spirit. I love this. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also will pray with my mind also. I, I'll pray with my understanding. I'm praying in my tongues. It's building me up. I'm praying maybe for interpretation, but I don't have interpretation. I still feel that I'm being built up because I'm praying in my spirit, even though I don't understand it. But I know what I want to do. I'll pray with my mind also. I'll do both. He says, I also will sing and praise with my spirit. And that's why we often say that this is a prayer language or a praise language or a thanksgiving language. And we speak it in an unknown tongue, unknown to us, but known to God. It's a form of praise and worship. So if it's interpreted, what should it sound like? Father, we magnify you for how awesome you really are. We're filled with praise because of your goodness and mercy toward us. It's directed to God. It is an interpretation. Uh, you know, it's not, again, a translation, but it should be directed to Jesus. It should be a form of thanks or, or praise or thanksgiving. So I've been in so many Pentecostal services where there have been tongues, but it wasn't directed to God. And they interpret it, and next thing I find out, it's God speaking to us. It's contrary to Scripture. That's why so many people get turned off by tongues, because people abuse it. And I will sing with my spirit, and I will sing with my mind also. Isn't that wonderful? Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, so we give thanks with our spirit as we speak in tongues, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? I'd rather have you prophesy or interpret your tongue. For verse 17, for you may be given thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God, verse 18, underline this one, I thank God I speak in tongues more than how many of you? All of you. I mean, the Apostle Paul here says, that, you know, I'm not poo-pooing tongues. I'm talking about building the body of Christ up. And if you can't interpret your tongue, shut up. And do it in your closet. We're talking about building the body. I am so concerned for the churches that they're strong and vibrant and moving in the Holy Spirit. I need you to seek spiritual gifts. I need you to build the body up. And whatever gift does that, do that. Whatever gift distracts, then do it privately. Good? So far, are we tracking? Hi, my name is George. I like you. Are we tracking? Yeah. Never listen, to, never listen to church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in tongue. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. There's something about prophecy that is incredible, he tells us here. It's so important. So f verse 39, so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. No time did Paul say speaking in tongues is off the charts. No, we're not going to do it anymore. He just wants it in order. So far, so good? Yeah, okay. No opposition there. Verse 40, but all things should be done, what? In, with decency and order. Spiritual gifts are to be used and expressed in a biblical fashion. That's why cessationists have problems with the gifts, because they just see the abuse. But if we just go back to Scripture... And we realize what he teaches us here. That we don't need to abuse the gifts if we do it biblically. And this is what we're learning here as we've studied about the Holy Spirit. We have no more time. Desire spiritual gifts. Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts. And especially prophecy. I want you to build up the body of Christ. Pastor Edwin would love every one of you to find your spiritual gift, whether it's serving, hospitality, whatever it might be. Gift of healing, mercy. Because we need you, the body needs you, if we're going to be strong. We just can't all cling on Pastor Aaron, just keep pulling him down. You know, we're there to uphold his hands. We're there like Ur and Aaron. As he begins to minister, we're there to uphold his hands with our gifts also, too, and joining in his gifts to build the body of Christ up. You know, we need to participate. It's a participation sport. It's not a lone ranger sport. We need each other. Paul makes that so clear. I need you. You need me. You need to pray for my gifts. I need to pray for your gifts. I need to use mine. You need to use theirs. Yours. 
And then there is this gift of the Holy Spirit that he gives us, and it's the gift of tongues. And I believe that every one of us can speak in tongues. Well, we know. Will it all be possible? Probably not. But I, I think we can. If we're not inhibited, if we allow the Holy Spirit to allow him to speak through us, because it's spirit to spirit. So I just pray that today, maybe in your car, maybe right here, that you just say, Lord, give me the gifts, whatever they are. And, and Lord, I desire even the gift of tongues because I need to be edify, I need to edify myself. And there's times I don't know how to pray. I don't have the words and I, I need to bypass my mind and I need my spirit within me that deep will cry out to deep, Lord. My spirit will cry out to you even though I don't understand it. And I just want to pray in this spiritual language that you understand. Just ask the Lord to give you that gift. And then when you do, believe that he's given it to you. And quit speaking in English and go into that spiritual language. All right? All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Pastor Aaron. And if you want later, you know, we're not in a hurry. I'd love to lay hands on you and pray for you and, and all these gifts. We, we see in the Bible that they laid hands on some and they received Others, they just spoke the word and it happened. But our desire is just to really see our church grow strong, 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 strong. And I want to just share, you know, the reason I need to pray in tongues, I, I'm not like Pastor Aaron. He was the most eloquent prayer warrior there is. I mean, when he prays, he preaches. You ever notice that? I mean, he, can, he just goes to town, and I just love it. Many of us aren't that way. We wish we could be, and that's why I probably use my prayer language at times because I, 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 in my prayer language I feel like I'm Pastor Aaron I'm really talking to God it's really, it's really cool so we love you brother I love you man Thanks. thank you two things before we uh, enjoy our afternoon we had a wonderful time after first service of course our time was limited in this little Q&A time but boy it was just exciting and uh, thoroughly enjoyable so we look forward to that two quick things first brother thank you Thank you. Why don't you, uh, yeah. These past four weeks have been thoroughly enjoyable for me. Be your, your cheering section from the back. You guys don't see me, and that's good. But I'm always trying to cheer on George a little bit. Uh, just thorough, eloquent, excellent teaching. Um, and, I, and this morning was no exception. Uh, I look forward to, we'll see if we can do kind of a box set of this message these four weeks and, and have that available for you to uh, enjoy and maybe pass around a little bit. We'll see what happens with that. But, uh, of course, all the messages are a free listen on our new app or on the website or whatever. There's all sorts of ways to listen. What a fantastic uh, four-week study and what a fantastic morning. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, I said it before, I'll say it again. I just couldn't have done as well of a job as you did, so... Now I have the mic and you don't, so I can say things about you. But secondly, you know, our heart for this morning um, is to not give you a full elaborate explanation for two reasons, because that's impossible. You just don't have enough time. And secondly, because, and think this through, that's not what the scripture does. The scripture gives a foundation and an introduction, and it's as if the Lord says, you know, search these things out for yourself. Not through a person, not through a pastor, but here's the foundation, here's the introduction, all the gifts and kind of what they are and how they work now. See me for details. And that's what you get to do, right? And I'm so thankful. I always like to remember, and hopefully I do, my position as a pastor. It's never to get in the way. I think we said that last Sunday, right? We're pastors. We walk the bride down the aisle to the groom, and the groom's Jesus. Amen? So we have to be really careful how we treat the bride, but it's so wonderful to remember that that's God's heart, a foundation, an introduction. Now you just get to go and uh, fall more in love with Jesus as you search these things out. I pray you do. You know, if you don't, we still love you. I love that, what was it, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, Paul said, as many as are mature, let them have this mind. And if not, hey, the Lord will reveal even this to you. <laughs> and it's a great prayer. Why don't we stand? And if you'd like some prayer, we're going to have some um, pastors and elders up front. George and I, we're going to kind of meet right here with those of you who want to be a part of the Q&A. 
uh, if that's uh, uh, if you fit into neither group and you just want to enjoy some fellowship you know we have a ton of baked goods and other items in the foyer so make sure and hang out sometimes it's hard to to you know get to know new people and whatnot but just take a chance if you stick around for even a few minutes somebody's going to get you and they'll come after you uh, so hang around for a little bit so we can enjoy some fellowship Lord, we just are so thankful for these four weeks, and we're looking forward to just more and more good fruit. Send us out in strength and wisdom and power, Lord, to go, God, and to uh, be a light in a dark world, Lord, to express love in a world that doesn't even know what it means. God, to be holy as you are holy, not because we're better, but because, Lord, we, we serve an almighty God. And so send us out with joy, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen. God bless, guys.